last keynote tonight. Before we start, uh, just to tell you that after the keynote, we would like to give you the prices regarding the, the, the quiz that we uh, <coughs> had at the conference. So, okay. When um, we have quite the same experience with uh, Lasse than with Jürgen, when, uh, when, when we start to set up the, the conference, um, Anko Tochman, Anko, I was from, from Holland, he uh, wrote me an email and said, hey, if you have to invite Jürgen for a keynote, he says, great, you have to read the book, and so on. And, and I said, okay, let's see, so we contacted you, and we're very happy that you're here. And when I read your uh, bio, and I think you are maybe one of the few people uh, in, in the agile world that is so polyphasetic. There is a lot of people here doing many things by side, but it's incredible all the things that you're doing. I mean, it's not only that you are a writer, but uh, you are also a dreamer. It's interesting to read it, okay? Because I am also a dreamer. I dream a lot, that's why we have the agile testing days. <laughs> it's a dream, or was a dream. And um, I'm really happy that you're here. I'm really keen to see your keynote. And uh, I already said you are invited for next year, even uh, without seeing the keynote. Okay, I think it's going to be great. I'm not, doing, I'm not doing pressure, <laughs> but I think so. Welcome. Okay, this is your audience. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The words are beautiful, but I wouldn't believe them if I were you. Actually, I think there's something else going on. Like, this is the ending keynote of the Agile Testing Days. Two days ago, I did the ending keynote at Smidic in, in Oslo. Uh, next week, I will be the last keynote at Agile Grenoble. I see a pattern there. I think organizers have discovered something about me. And I think, uh, they, I think they have realized that I'm the best person to clean everyone out of the room and get this building empty. <laughs> They want all the seats vacant by the end of my talk. I think that's the real reason, but that's just my, uh, my assumption. Um, this, uh, this talk begins with, uh, with failure. Some of uh, that uh, is, it might be familiar to you. Actually, this is what, what your, your profession uh, for some of you to, to find some of, uh, of those failures in software. Uh, I have a lot of experience with failure. failure. I've been failing for 15 years. Uh, it started when, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was 16 years old. I was heavily into disco dance music at that time. This was the 80s. And uh, I wanted to start a newsletter. That was a paper newsletter. So in order to finance it, I needed advertisers. So I went about to find advertisers for my newsletter. Nobody wanted to work with me. That was my first failed project. But no problem, I already had other projects on my mind. Uh, I started a business with a friend of mine, uh, converting WordPerfect macros to, to, uh, to Word, because lots of businesses at that time were switching from one uh, to another. And uh, that, that was sort of successful. We had some employees uh, employed, uh, people employed for us. But uh, after a few years, the whole business collapsed. Another failure. No problem, I had a new idea. I, uh, I had a, a, a website that was, was quite popular with information about computer games. And that, so that earned me some money through advertisers and, and sponsors. And I wrote a business plan for it. It was a fabulous business plan. It looked beautiful. Lots of pretty pictures in it of, of revenues that would be making in the future. And uh, I was so good at it that I won an award. I was the, the entrepreneur of the year in, uh, in my country. And uh, it enabled me to find uh, informal investors. They invested 1 million euros in, in our business. Uh, and we were very, very successful at spending that money to the last euro. <laughs> Unfortunately, we did not find any customers. So uh, we had to close the doors there as well. And this went on and on. I, I failed at being a cartoonist. I tried to write a novel and I failed. I have about 15 failed relationships behind me. And uh, this, uh, this was sort of the pattern for, for about 15 years. Failure all, uh, all around. At, uh, uh, when, when I started uh, looking for jobs, I even warned my, my, uh, my employers, uh, you might want to know that I destroyed all the previous businesses where I, 
where I worked on. So realize that. Actually, that turned into a new idea. Maybe you want to hire me and then make me work for your competitor. <laughs> I will annihilate them. <laughs> but uh, no, this, uh, this doesn't, didn't work out either. Uh, until I started writing a blog. That was early 2008. And uh, for some reason, that was successful. Because a few <clears throat> months ago, this, uh, this list was published of the most popular agile blogs in the world based on, on, on Google PageRank, Twitter followers, uh, RSS feeds. And number one is Martin Fowler, number two is Mike Cohn, and number three, that's me, Jürgen Aplo. Nice to meet you, thank you. So uh, yeah, I, at last I had a success. That, that, was, uh, that, was, uh, that was nice. I still don't know why I deserved it. It, it should have been another big failure. Uh, and and at sometimes I think uh, I, I had already used up all the amount of failure that was available for me in the whole universe. It was inevitable that something had to succeed. Uh, this 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 would have this should have been a failure, but some god up there said, no 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 no, you cannot you cannot have uh, that much failure again. There will be nothing left for the European Union. <laughs> so. At last, uh, at last, a success. And, and then I, I wrote this book, Management 3.0. You might have heard of it. Uh, my publisher is happy with it, so I suppose that's a success as well. Uh, I'm now doing courses based on the book, and they're doing pretty well. And uh, earlier this year, I had this idea of, of, of starting an Agile Lean Europe network because I wanted people to collaborate across boundaries. And what do you know, within half a year, a conference was organized, not by me, but by other people, with 200 attendees from 34 different countries. And it was amazing. So that was success, a success too. So I, I now have people asking me, how do you do that? I literally got that question, uh, got that question over lunch during the conference. Someone said to me, Jürgen, you have been a pathetic, miserable failure for 15 years. Well, he didn't really phrase it like that, but I think it, that's what he meant. And, and now you have these successes, what do you do? And I, I don't know, maybe I figured something out. I failed so much, I must have learned something. So that is what I'm trying to divulge here, what the things that I have, uh, have learned. And you can, you can expand that to, to how to become a successful worker at whatever you do, whether it is a presenter, a tester, a software developer, uh, whatever, uh, how to be more successful. In your, in your work. I think there are two things to start with. First of all, obviously, you have to increase your skills. And you, we, we all know the shoe hurry levels, right? The, 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 the shoe level is, is starting with the fundamentals, learning the basics, like I learned how to ride my bicycle when I was five or six years old. I didn't know how to brake, so I just flung myself in the bushes when I needed to stop. My mother said, whenever I saw the bushes do like this, I knew that you were coming home. And then after a while, I learned how to break, and then I started the second level, the, 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 the ha level, which is, which is learning to stop when, even though the traffic light is green, uh, there's a car rushing by, so it might be wise to, to, to stop, uh, stop, stop cycling. And then the, at, at the end, the re-level is transcendence. You, everything comes natural, right? You, you're cycling and dreaming and listening to your, to your iPod, and you arrive at your destination, and you remove your iPod. And th you don't know how you got there, actually, and you're wondering, why is that dead cat in, my, in the spokes of my wheels? <laughs> that's, that's the transcendence at the highest level. Then there's another uh, uh, model that Jerry Weinberg suggested it, and he says there are six levels for, for, for discipline. The first one is oblivious, which is we do not even know that we follow processes, that there are processes. And the second one is variable, we do whatever we feel like at the moment. I particularly remember the third one from my last job. Yes, we have our routines and we follow them, except when we panic. <laughs> then we drop everything. Of course, we're interested in the last one, congruent. Everyone is, is in, in involved in improving everything all the time. So I thought about that and I thought, hmm, these seem to be two different scales. Where one is skill, you, you build that up over, over a period of time. Some say it takes you 10,000 hours to be your master at something. Um, and, others, uh, uh, and the other scale is discipline. This can change from day to day. This can, uh, this can depend on your mood, whether or not you had a fight with your spouse in the morning, things like that. 
And both skill and discipline are important. And the blue part is what you're aiming for as a professional, of course. Highly skilled and disciplined at what you're doing from day to day. And I would say me driving, uh, that would be here. I think I'm quite skilled after 20 years of driving. Not that disciplined, I'm afraid, I have to admit. I always forget to check the pressure of my tires and things like that. It is a wonder that I now have my tires replaced with winter tires. That's a first for me after 20 years. Um, and writing would be here, for example. I'm a mediocre writer, I would say, but very, very, very disciplined. Disciplined. In, in the number of hours that I, that I spend writing. So uh, for me, that's a useful model. And in order to be professionals, we grow our skills and discipline. And, uh, and here's how. This is my suggestion. The seven duties of software professionals. First, motivate yourself. As I said, one of my failures was uh, being a cartoonist. I once had the idea of, of creating a political cartoon. And um, I realized my, my motivation was, was incorrect there. Because I really like to complain about governments and politics. I love doing that. And in order to do that, I thought, hmm, maybe I could make drawings uh, 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 about that. Well, I am an adequate uh, illus illustrator, but my passion is not in drawing. And my passion is also not in cracking jokes. So making funny things in drawings about politics that was, well, I could, I, I could do something, but my passion was not in it. I felt it, like this was not something that I wanted to be spectacularly good at. So, so my, my intrinsic motivators were not correct there. I, I researched that, intrinsic desires of, of people, and I found uh, uh, one book as an example, Stephen Rice, Who Am I? The 16 Basic Desires That Motivate Us. He came up with this list. The intrinsic desires of people are acceptance and physical activity and curiosity, all the way down to tranquility, order, and vengeance. Well, as, as software professionals, I think we can strike a few things out. Uh, I usually was not interested in food, love, and sex on the projects that I have been working on over the last 10 years, but of course, I've not been working in Italy, so I wouldn't know. Um, also, the need to raise children. Well, I'm not from Sweden, so I wouldn't know. So I, I tend to strike these out, and that leaves me with nine basic desires. And there's another book by, uh, by Edward Decky and Richard Ryan. And they said uh, there are three uh, basic uh, desires. They call it self-determination theory. And it is competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Well, it turns out relatedness is social contact, autonomy is independence. Competence is one that I didn't have on the list yet. So I add that one, it gives me 10. Yay, 10 is a nice number. 10 intrinsic desires. And then, of course, there's the book by Daniel Pink. I'm sure you all know about it. He said, our drivers are purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Uh, he, he said he this was based on self-determination re research, but he cheated a little because that was about relatedness, autonomy, and competence, while Daniel Pink was referring to purpose, autonomy, and mastery. So he changed one. I don't know why, but uh, I don't care because they're on my list anyway. Ten intrinsic desires, and by reordering them and, and coming up with, with two synonyms, I now have the, 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 the acronym CHAMP FROGS. I have absolutely no idea what champ frogs are. <laughs> Someday I will find out, I think. But this gives me a way to, uh, to remember them. So uh, what, I, what I did recently, I, I turned them into an exercise in my course. And it seems that people really like it. I now have these 10 colorful cards with the 10 motivators. And I asked them to, to put them in order. What is important for you and what is not important for you? Because this, this differs from person to person. Like the top row is very important for me. And, and, and I've discovered, for example, this is why I love speaking. I love, I love being on the stage here. Why? Because this, this ties into freedom. This is my area. I can do anything I want here. This is my stage. You're not on it. This is mine. Whether I do dance or, or sing or whatever, that's my freedom that I have. I love that. And the curiosity, it ties into curiosity because you have to research stuff in order to inspire you. I have to dive into topics and then find out why the universe is as it is. And of course, mastery, being a professional and, and acceptance. No matter how weird the things that I, that I do on stage, you love me even more. 
So that's, uh, that, that all ties into my, my main motivators. And I don't care about order, honor, power, and, re and relatedness. They are less important to me. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can follow the link at the bottom of the, of the slide or ask me about it later. So my first question to you is, are you aligning your work with your own intrinsic motivators? Are they connecting with each other? Is, is what you do from day to day really addressing those most important motiva motivators of the 10 that I referred to earlier? Then, second one, direct yourself. My, uh, my first blog post, or the second, uh, first or second, um, was this, why I started this blog. And it said clearly that I started my blog to write a book. But I figured out that in order to understand how to write a blog, I had to have a feedback cycle going and build up readership and learn how to write. So I started with uh, a blog. But I did have this vision in my mind that I wanted to have this, this physical book. I could see it in front of me. And, 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 and it, it, was, it was clear what, that I would be holding that, that physical book after a few years. And, and people would be asking me to sign it and things like that. That, that, that sounded awesome. So I had this vision of, of where I wanted to be. Now there are a few different words, uh, the similar goal, vision, mission, uh, objective. Let's ignore the subtle differences for now. Uh, there are some, some criteria. You probably know about the SMART criteria. Simple, measurable, actionable, realistic, time-bound. There are, there are extensions to it. There are alternatives like bag, big, hairy, audacious goal and, and raw relevant, attainable, whatever, different, uh, different checklists. And um, um, you, can, you can apply them to any goal that the person has or a company has. Like this is an interesting uh, exercise I, that I do with people in my courses. This is the mission statement of one of the biggest software companies in the world. I will not tell you which it is. Start with the letter M. And... Um, it says, as a company and as individuals, we value integrity, honesty, openness, op uh, personal excellence, uh, continual self-improvement, blah, blah, blah. We are committed to our customers and partners, etc., etc. We hold ourselves accountable to our customers, shareholders, partners, etc., etc., and striving for the highest quality. There's only one thing we're seeing that's world peace, exactly. <laughs> Everything else is on there. Everything is on. So, this is, I think, not a very useful mission statement, actually. It doesn't really steer people. They cannot visualize it. They, 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 they don't know what they are supposed to do in their day-to-day -day decisions. Here's another one. Our mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Google's mission statement. Everyone knows it. Uh, usually people find that, that of these criteria here, at least six or seven have been met. It's not time-bound. It's not a smart goal. It doesn't have to be at, at that high level of the organization. But it's more useful. But by now I've learned from, from, from complexity science and, and social research that it is even, even more useful not to write mission statements. It is even more useful to, to come up with something that is visual, something that is tangible, something that people can play with. Metaphors, stories, pictures. And this is, the, this is the, the, the goal that we created for the Agile in Europe network in, in, in Spain, uh, in uh, Madrid, a few months ago. It was awesome. 40 people discovering metaphors and sharing stories. And, 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 and you, will, you will have to watch the video, the three-minute video, in order to understand what the model is about. I, I do not know what the details about it anymore. Probably the, the big, hairy elephant in the middle is Germany or something. I, I don't know. The, the boat might have been for the people from the UK, uh, something like that. But anyways, you, we, we turned it into something that was visual, and that really worked. So I now do this, I now do this in, in with, with my students as well. I have them create visual metaphors for, for the course. What is it that you want to get out of, of the course? And they come up with things like, like ants trying to lift up acorns together, or, or uh, birds teaching an elephant how to fly, amazing metaphors that they come up with. Uh, the, 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 the most interesting one so far was that they drew my, my face with my skull open and straws in it because they said, we want to suck your brain. <laughs> was a bit scary, I have to admit. <laughs> but uh, for them, a very useful one. 
And uh, these are all, these are all uh, uh, visualized goals, and, and I think they work better. But of course, as Liz Keough said, uh, they're just ideas. Our visions of the future, they're ideas of where we want to end up. And actually, they change in, in collaboration and contact with other people. Like my original version was the book uh, for the book was about uh, writing about complexity and software development. And after my contact with other people, I understood that I had to write something about management because many people were struggling with that topic. And by chance, I happened to know something about that. So you always need to have a vision. And when I wrote the book, it was clear that I was already achieving my, my, my first goal. So I had to think about the next one. And the next one was, and it is there somewhere in the book, a keynote speech at a major conference. That would, be an, a ma that would be a good vision. I would love that. I had never done something like that before. So I could picture myself standing in front of 20, 100, 200, sorry, 200 people. OK, a, a few of them have left already because they're idiots. So we're left with only, <laughs> with only 10. That doesn't matter. So there are 10 people in the room, and, they, and I'm inspiring them. And, and they're, they're applauding and laughing. And at the end, they will rush on the stage and start kissing and hugging and fighting over my underpants. <laughs> OK, you can take the metaphor too far. So. <laughs> But um, yeah, that was my vision at that, uh, at that time. I always have a new vision in, uh, in mind. So my question to you as a software professional is what do you see in your future? Or what do you see in your future? Very important to think about that. Then, third one, educate yourself. When I finished uh, the university, I studied software engineering. Um, I, uh, I started programming, but I was so bad that they quickly promoted me away to management within one or two years. <laughs> and, uh, and I found it a bit difficult, because I had lots of experience programming computers, but I, had not really much, I didn't have much experience with people. Actually, to me, to me they, were, they were computers on legs with hair, right? So, and... <laughs> It, 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 did not, it, didn't, it didn't work when I tried to instruct them. <laughs> Nothing happened. Um, exploratory testing was very, very difficult and had very nasty side effects. <laughs> and that was basically because I had never learned how to, how to manage people. There were books about that, of course, uh, but I never read them. And, and now I do. Whenever I need to do something, whenever I, 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 I have a, a project going on, I invest time in reading. This is my bookcase. It is my self-designed bookcase. It is four meters high. If people ask me, how do you get to the top row, I, I say, I use a trampoline. Um, and actually, it is, this is an old picture because by now we have extended it uh, to the side because people like Johanna Rothman just cannot stop writing. <laughs> so we now have the Johanna Rothman wing here on the, on the right side. <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, I invest in, uh, in reading. And for example, if I, if I want to know, or if I want to understand how people think about systems, I invest time in reading about complexity science and systems thinking books. And when I started developing my course, even before I wrote the first sentence, I heavily invested in, in books about how the brain works and how people teach and how people learn. And, and when I wanted to invest in changing other people's behaviors or influencing them, I read books about change management and influencing people. And there's one of the authors over here. So uh, I invest in reading. It's surprising how very few people actually do that. They just, they just get started. And nobody needs to tell me how because I self-organize. Here's the definition of self-organization from, from Wikipedia. Self-organization is the process of attraction and repulsion in which the internal organization um, uh, of a system increases in complexity without being guided or managed. Nobody needs to guide or manage me in order to educate myself. As Uncle Bob said, your career is your own responsibility. Your, empl your employer is not your mother. So this is very, very important. And some people don't, don't realize that. They just wait until somebody gives them some knowledge or whatever. So this also ties into Las Cosquelas uh, suggestion uh, or plea, uh, you cannot afford not to learn a new thing. So my question to you is, um, how have you decided to learn? 
okay, I like reading books, I love reading books, but maybe you have other ways of, of, of getting that uh, knowledge in your, in your head to actually do something uh, about it. Because I've, I've interviewed software developers uh, where that, that just gave me a blank stare when I asked them a question about test-driven development, for example. They had never heard of test-driven development. So how can you, com how can you, uh, how can you be a software developer if you don't even know the basic terminology? <coughs> Next one, measure yourself. This, uh, this time I want to start with a, with a quote by Peter Drucker, what gets measured gets managed, or what you measure is what you get. Don't remember which one was his, uh, actually. Uh, but this is a very important one. Metrics are important, but they, they always lead to sub-optimization. As, as, as soon as you start measuring something, that part of the system will get optimized, is what system theorists tell us. So uh, I've been struggling with that, and one thing that I came up with, uh, not just by myself, but by stealing stuff from other people, of course, um, is to measure for, for multiple stakeholders of the organization or yourself. Like uh, you have employees, you also have the team, the at the team level that can be a goal, at the organizational level that can be a goal, like Google's mission statement. But you also have customers and suppliers, uh, the manager or the shareholder of the, of the system from the outside, and the local community or the, the, the virtual or geographical community that is interested in what you're doing. So I turned that into a matrix that I now use to reflect on my own metrics. Uh, I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, it is a bit like a balanced scorecard. That was sort of a good idea, uh, but with bad consequences. So the idea was right. They said you need multiple metrics, because otherwise you're going to, uh, to sub-optimize if you just measure one or two things. You need, you need multiple metrics. But they applied it to the organizations as machines. The hierarchical m machine thinking was, uh, was used in the books, as if the CEO is driving their organization with this dashboard of metrics in front of them. That was how the balanced scorecard was implemented. And I prefer to see it as a, as a social system, as a complex adaptive system. And, and here's an example that I use myself. Like I, I, do, I do courses, and me as an employee, I am interested in, in, interested in inspiring people. So that is, what, what I, that is what I measure by looking at the evaluations and the sticky notes to see if I really have inspired people. Otherwise, I won't be happy. But I also have a team back home, and what we measure in an informal way is our happiness. Working together and sitting in the coffee shop, drinking a coffee, not a Dutch kind of coffee shop, by the way, but a regular coffee shop. <laughs> Um, and at the same time, the customers are, of course, interested in stuff. They want actionable, actionable ideas, things that they can try back home or at, or at the organization. And I actually measure that. How many times do they mention specific actionable stuff in the evaluations? Like, this is something that we want to, want to try out. And then there are some people giving me ideas, like, Jürgen, I have this fantastic book about, about pink mutant fluffy bunnies, and this is exactly what you need in your course. And I think, okay, interesting. So I put it on my list, and it might be, might be useful to measure the cycle time. How long does it take me to implement that idea in my course? Because that's what the suppliers are interested in. And finally, the, the Agile community is interested in what I do, apparently, because otherwise, I wouldn't get these amazing invites. And uh, I measure that by the number of times the blog posts are accessed, or the number of times the, the PowerPoint slides are downloaded. So I have lots of different metrics for different stakeholders. So you always measure from the outside in. That's, that's the main point here. Which stakeholders are interested in what you're doing? And I have these ideas from John Seddon's book, Freedom from Command and Control. Because he said, basically, there are three principles for good metrics. The first one is the metric has to relate to some stakeholder's goal, somebody who's interested in what you're doing. The second is you measure, measure it to improve part of the system, otherwise it makes no sense to measure things. And three is also important, the data should be collected by the one who needs it or is interested in it. Like the third one is violated when, when an organization needs to know which customers are profitable and which are not. But then the accounting department asks all the employees to fill out timesheets. But the employees are not interested in that information. The accounting department is. So they should find a different way of coming up with that, with that uh, metric. 
So I found those three uh, principles useful. I think Goiko added a fourth one. He said the value of a metric is equal to the value of the decision that it informs. If you're not making any decisions based on the metrics that you have, you, it's no point measuring the th those, uh, those things. <coughs> one last comment. These are often confused. Metrics versus targets versus incentives. Sometimes I hear people complain about metrics, but what they really mean is that there apparently are incentives attached to the metrics in their organization, and these incentives can be very, very bad. But measuring things for yourself in order to improve, that could be good. So, my next question to you is, how do you track your growth as a software professional? Is that something you think about? Then, connect yourself. Sounds a bit silly, connect yourself, but it, it aligned better with all the others, so I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I had, um, as I said, I had this, this, this amazing idea that, 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 that turned me into an, uh, into an entrepreneur with, with one million euros in, in investments behind me. And uh, I, I read some articles in, in, in Fast Company and Inc. and these kinds of magazines. And they told me, you have to do, you have to network. You have to network with other people. So I thought, okay, okay. So I was there all those, in those, on those network events, and there were people here with beers, like, oh, ah, ha, blah, 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 ha, 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 blah, 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 blah. Okay, and there were other people over here with suits and ties, of fa, 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 with expensive wine, fa, 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 fa. And I was there in the middle with my Coca Cola light, <laughs> feeling very, very sad and alone. So I decided networking is stupid. Networking is for idiots. They're not doing anything on those networking events. So I went back to my computer and I started typing angrily as a, I'm, I'm going to be a better computer, pro computer programmer and a better, better entrepreneur and invest in my knowledge and expertise. Of course, I was wrong. I was wrong, as Rob Cross said in The Hidden Power of Social Networks. Uh, he said, from their research, it turned out that, that individual expertise did not distinguish people as high performers. Uh, he said, what distinguishes high performers are large and diversified personal networks. So this is interesting for recruiters and, and, and HR people. They should not in the first place ask for people's expertise and knowledge in their heads. They should ask, which people do you know? How are you connected with the rest of the world? Which people do you hang out with? Because that's a much better indicator for your, for your performance as a, as a professional. Of course, there are different ways of doing that. We already know about cross-functional teams. Perfect example of that. We love cross-functional teams in Agile, <coughs> working with people across different disciplines. Judging from the faces, I'm quite sure that this one is the tester over here. <laughs> and I think this one is the manager. This is... This is how I felt. So, uh, but that's what we already do, right? In Agile, we work with different people from dis different disciplines. What we uh, should also be doing, oh, here's a quote by, uh, by Linda, Linda Rising. You don't have to like everyone on your team to have collaboration work. Exactly. I, I didn't like those other people with the beers and the wine because I don't drink it and I didn't understand what they were talking about. So I didn't want to associate myself uh, with them, but that was wrong. I should have found, find, found out a way to, to, to collaborate uh, with them. I, I understand that now. So the cross-functional team is one example. Um, if you Google for, for, for user groups, you find lots of suggestions for cross-company collaboration in, in, uh, with, with, with lean groups and scrum groups and agile groups and, and, and Kanban groups. Lots of choices there in, in countries around the world. And of course, I have to plug the Agile Lean Europe network uh, in a cross-border uh, fashion, where we had the first, uh, uh, the first uh, conference a few months ago in, in September, and the next one, it was just decided a few days ago, it will be in, in Barcelona next, uh, next year in September, somewhere around there. Uh, you're all invited. So uh, this is collaboration across, uh, across the continent, across borders. And uh, as Joanna Rothma said, if you cannot do it with people, you can do it with a tool. And I was only interested in, in, in managing tools when I, was, when I just finished the, the university. I still had to learn how to deal with people. 
It was a painful experience, but in the end, I think I sort of get the idea there. So the question is, how do you diversify your personal network? Are you investing in that? Very important. And then, next one, brand yourself. Sounds a bit, uh, sounds a bit silly, brand yourself. But again, it is to align it with the, with the rest there, looks, looks prettier. Um, this, is, uh, this, is about, uh, this is comparable to, to putting makeup on, right? You, 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 want, you want yourself to be seen as a kind of person in the world around you. And you accentuate the positive, you camouflage the negative. You can't change yourself, but you can change something about you that increases your strengths and weakness, weakens your weaknesses. Uh, like, like I, I accentuate the fact that I'm brilliant, for example, that's my strength. And I, I camouflage the, the, the problem that I'm very, very modest. Right? So I, I, I put that away. So that is, that is about building your personal brand. And one thing that you should be doing is, is, is Googling yourself. If you had Googled my name about, I don't know, eight years ago, 10 years ago, you might have found out that I was the winner of an, of an award. You probably also would have seen some pictures of me riding a, a bicycle stark naked in the city of Apeldoorn in the Netherlands, <laughs> because I was participant of the World Naked Bike Ride. Was a lot of fun. But um, if you're interested in a personal brand, you have to think about these things. Is this something that you, that you want to be part of your brand? There's nothing interesting about star being stark naked on a bicycle. But is that something that you want to publish all over the world as part of you? So you have to Google your own name and, and see what, what the rest of the world sees as you. Is that the article that you wrote for a magazine? Is it the contribution of, of, of you to the Agile testing days? Maybe your own blog or something like that? Or, or is it that picture of you with your colleague when you were fighting in a portable swimming pool filled with yogurt? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that if, if that is part of the message that you want to send. And it's also about being different, being remarkable. Seth Godin had a, had a great metaphor for that. He said, be a purple cow, stand out. Be remarkable, different from the rest. How are you being remarkable? Like, 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 sorry, <clears throat> like uh, somebody over here. Yes, she's over there. She has, she has two donkeys. <laughs> yes, Lisa has two donkeys. How can you beat that? I have three donkeys. I you have three donkeys. <laughs> we have a winner over here. Any more donkeys? <laughs> I tried getting two camels into the elevator of my apartment flat, but I, that, was, that was not really successful. So now you have to, you have to find out a way to be remarkable, to, to stand out from the, from the rest. And as Seth Godin also said, um, you want to market and not sell your services. The people who sell services, they go, they go around the country and beg people to please use their products, please use our services because we're so good, but people are actually not that interested in it. You don't want that. What you want is marketing it so much that people come to you and beg, can we please, please, please buy your product? Can we please work with you because you are so awesome? That's what, that's what Apple has invested in. They have invested heavily in marketing not in salespeople walking around the country and trying to sell people iPhones that nobody wants to have. And, uh, and the same applies to, to, to resumes and, and, uh, and CVs. Do, do you want to be a person who sends out resumes to dozens of companies and ask them to, please, 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 can, please, can you please hire me because I'm so good and you just don't know it yet, but this is my CV. And, Maybe, maybe you want to, maybe you want to work with me together. That's, that's like selling yourself. No, you want to invest in marketing. You want them to come to you. You, you want them to beg, Can you, will you please, please work for us? Come work for us, it's, it's cool over here at our company. And then you say, okay, mm, I might consider. So um, what I require is um, this salary, a good computer, a massage every afternoon, and blue M&Ms on Fridays, <laughs> right? That's, so you send them a quote. You don't send them a resume. You sell them what you cost or what you, and, and what you will earn for them. 
So the question here that I have for you is how are you developing your personal brand? Are you actually thinking about that as a software professional? And then the last part, <clears throat> improve yourself. There are three drivers of improvement as far as I'm concerned. We hear all the time about, about adaptation, about looking backward and, and responding to change. It was the subtitle of Ken Beck's uh, uh, early book about extreme programming. Uh, embrace change. This is good. Actually, what we've learned over time with Agile is to shift away from anticipation to adaptation because we did far too much of that. We tried to anticipate everything with our projects. Now, anticipation is good. It's like alcohol. It's useful in very, very small doses, but people get too addicted to it. They want more and more. Uh, so we, sh we have to shift that to adaptation and leave a little bit of uh, anticipation uh, around because, yes, we do anticipate the features that the users will probably like for the next sprint. But then, as the Lean Startup movement says, then you have to verify if the users are actually using them and actually find them, find them valuable. And you want that feedback cycle to be as short as possible. But what people rarely point out is that you also need to do some exploration. These are three different strategies as, as, as found in, 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 in nature all around us. And the third one is just trying things out for the sake of experimentation. It is no adaptation because nobody was asking for those experiments. It is no anticipation because you have absolutely no clue what the effects will be. But uh, as, as a software professional, you are constantly, uh, con uh, constantly uh, uh, being, being confronted with an environment that surprises you all the time, with things that you had not expected. Well, do it back. Do something that the environment had never expected. You have that right. Pay them with equal coin, I would say. So do something that, that the environment had, had never seen coming, and you see what, see what the result is. And then Esther Derby said something like that. Take little actions, see how they work, and then do more small experiments. Small experiments are, 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 are fine there. You don't have to be do a great new experiment. The small ones are, are, are good. And Michael Bolton said something similar. He said, uh, discover new knowledge over executing repeated actions. So this is about new, uh, new knowledge that we uh, acquire because we do small experiments. So this is an, an, uh, an experiment that I am going to do right now. I have never done this before. Lasse Koskela will be proud of me because I'm now moving out of my comfort zone. I'm going to stand over, sit over here. And this is my tribute to Germany. Uh, Germany has, has done something amazing in the, uh, in, at the end of the 20th century that I'm, that I'm, uh, that I'm very, very thankful for. And to, uh, to, uh, to make it visual for you, I have to put on some hair. This is my long hair. So this is, right, so this is my hair, okay. This is, this is looking good, yep. And uh, I also need a white guitar. Where is my white guitar? My white guitar is, this is my sexy tablet computer. <laughs> it's not Apple, it's uh, Samsung. <laughs> <clears throat> this is my white guitar over here, you see it? So I will now play my white guitar like this. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Here we go. So. Okay, good. Wie eine Blume am Winter beginnt, so wie eine Feuer im eisigen Wind. Wie eine Puppe, die keiner mehr mag, fühle ich mich an manchen Tag. Dann sehe ich die Wolke, die über uns sind, und höre die Schreie der Vögel im Wind. Ich singe aus Angst vor dem Dunkel mein Lied und hoffe, dass nichts geschieht. And now everyone with me. Ein bisschen agile, ein bisschen testen für diese Erde, auf der wir wohnen. Ein bisschen agile, ein bisschen testen, ein bisschen warme, das wünsche ich mir. Ein bisschen agile, ein bisschen testen und dass die Menschen nicht so oft weinen. Ein bisschen agile, ein bisschen testen, dass ich die Hoffnung nicht mehr verliere. Fantastic. That was my that was my experiment. Well, 
Oh, that was fun. So, my question is, are you singing Nicole's remember, oh, that, sorry, are you singing improving, are you improving by adapting and anticipating and experimenting? Yes, that's, that's the real thing that I want you to do. So improve by adapting and anticipating and experimenting at the same time. Do something that people never, uh, never expected. Like Lisa Crispus said, how fascinating. I failed and I really learned something important from that. Well, I failed for 15 years. I did many, 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 many stupid things and I love telling about it because it sort of compensates all the bragging I do about all the, the few successes that I had. People like that. So uh, the things that you should be thinking about are motivate yourself, direct yourself, educate yourself, measure yourself, connect yourself, brand yourself and improve yourself. And that's the end of my talk. The slide share are fortunately I was able to, to suck the presentation through the little straw that we call the wireless here. <laughs> So it is now at, uh, at SlideShare. Sorry about that, uh, Jose. It had, I had to, at the, uh, right, I had to get it out. I had to get it out. Get it off of my system. <laughs> okay. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you, if you like. You, you might appreciate some of my stories on noab.nl. And of course, I have a book and a course, Management 3.0. And if you're interested, I will be in Dusseldorf and München very soon. So I hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. So, questions? Okay. The name of the girl is Nicole. He was singing there. Okay. 1982, if I remember yeah. well. Uh, just, I would consider becoming a politician because I heard Netherlands requires. Well, <clears throat> um, I, 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 yes, uh, I have considered to become a politician, but. Um, I should have done that 15 years when I still failed, so I could have destroyed the entire system. <laughs> right now, I have these successes all the time. I can't help it. So uh, I, I think it would not be wise for me to enter the polit politic uh, system right now, because you I might end up as, as, as a prime minister in the Netherlands. And I don't know if I should do that. So, but uh, I, it crossed my mind every now and then. Yeah. Other questions? More questions? Here's one. Yeah, the Googling yourself thing. I think probably most of us have Googled ourselves at one point or another. It doesn't always feel obvious what to do about it. I mean, for one thing, you have no control over the number of people with the same name as you who may or may not be doing interesting things. I share a yep. name with a guy who is head of some water board in the US, <laughs> and there's like endless, endless right. water board reports coming. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't know what to do about that guy apart right. from assassinating him. Mm, yeah, or <laughs> assassinate, or change your name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really Jürgen Apollo. <laughs> no, just kidding. More questions? So, great. Thank you very much, Jose. It was a so pleasure. My, the intention was to clean this room out by the end of the, yeah. by the, end of the keynote. But I, I failed there too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.